So, um, only walked around once, but you can tell the students who have an idea or a handle on what to do and the ones who don't. It's just a look on their face. But let's just handle a few obvious things. Um, again, you start here. Free by diagram, each person. I know that the only way they travel in a circular path if they're up here is if there's an unbalanced force downwards. It's the only way they can travel in a circular path. And we've talked about this a couple times, but if you're traveling in a circle, your direction is changing. There must be an unbalanced force that is perpendicular to your velocity. So there also must be an unbalanced force upwards down there. If your notes don't tell you that, change your notes. These are both Newton's second law problems because we're accelerating. Now, if I look at the forces acting on the person at the very top, I'm thinking weight downwards. I can commit to that. There's got to be weight. And a smaller normal force upwards. And that's it. There should be no other forces or no other forces indicated on there. And for those of you talking about sideways forces, why? The velocity is constant at that instance. So the net force horizontally is zero. It's just vertical. Now, I said to you that you should make your positive direction the direction of the acceleration. So I'm going to make downwards positive. And now I'm going to go through my set of, uh, I'm sorry, I've gone through all my set of forces because there's no strings attached. There's no friction necessary. All that's left now is to set that equal to MA. But they're traveling in a circle. Now, one thing that many of you did miss yesterday by being absent is we talked about the difference between angular velocity and linear velocity. That was an important discussion. One in which I probably said out loud many times, you should already know this. And people hate it when I say that because they feel like there's something wrong with them when they don't. On the other hand, when you're not here to hear that, then you don't know it either way. And that's going to be a little frustrating because we need that. But I gave the angular velocity of the Ferris wheel, the rate at which it's spinning. But we have an expression for centripetal acceleration that's in terms of the linear velocity of the person. And they do have a linear velocity at this instance. But the Ferris wheel has an angular velocity. It's rotating at a certain rate, one rotation every six seconds. So for all the people who need this, I'll leave it like that. Let's take a, just a moment to deal with perhaps a bit of your inadequacies in that there is a connection between rotational speed and linear speed. So if we're looking at something that's rotating and there's an object on the disk that's rotating, it has a linear speed. But the object has an angular speed. We use lowercase omega as a symbol for lower for angular velocity. So look, I will just say omega. And if you don't know what omega is, you'll probably be in trouble. And if you don't recognize that as omega, you'll probably be in trouble. So in your notes, perhaps you could connect three dots together for me. The symbol for omega, the name of omega, and what it represents. Because that's quite a bit. Because when you refer to it as W, I'll be frustrated. So, 
Omega, Greek letter, lowercase, represents either rotational or angular speed or velocity. I'll use any combination of those four words. Rotational speed, angular velocity, angular speed, rotational velocity, they all mean the same thing. Although there is direction associated with rotational motion. And now the big thing is you need to understand that where you are on the object determines how fast you're actually traveling. This thing is rotating about its center. The person who is further away from the center is traveling faster than the person who is closer to the center. I always think that's obvious, but then I find people who don't know that it's obvious. So for those of you who don't know that it's obvious, would you agree that they both come back to the same starting point at the same time? Meaning if this is the starting point, when they go around, it's not like the guy who's located here can go around and make it there sooner than the guy who's located here, right? When they go around, they both go around Fair. That means that the guy that's closer to the center is making a smaller circle than the guy who's out here at the edge. So one of them is traveling faster than the other. That's not a surprise and shouldn't be to you. What might be a surprise is the connection between linear and angular. It's just a direct proportion based on the radius your distance from the center of curvature. So if you're twice as far away from the radius of curvature, then you're going twice as fast. That's why it's always fun to be on the horses on the outside edge of the carousel, not the ones on the inside of the carousel. The ones on the inside, those are for little kids. The ones on the outside, that's for you guys. Kind of, I mean, maybe you're too old for that. You'll probably get in trouble at Bush Gardens when you ride it. Now, that's enough for me to kind of say I've done my, my, my fair share of repeating myself. We'll get back to this. Because what that also means then is I can write this as omega times r squared over r. Two ways to write centripetal acceleration now. Use the one that makes the most sense. By the way, this can be simplified. So I'm just going to cut to that chase and make sure we understand that this could be omega squared times r. Two different ways to write the centripetal acceleration. Use the one that makes the most sense. By the way, this is, is not obvious and should be, omega in any computation has to be in radians. So you can't use V equals omega R unless you first put omega in radians. Since I gave your value in rotations, you'll have to convert rotations to radians. I'm assuming you can do that. I use unit multipliers. All right. All of that being said, I think now we can uh, finish mg minus normal equals m omega squared r. That's, that's the answer. That tells me how to find the normal force on the person. Now, yeah, you probably like to plug in numbers and stuff. I, I'm less likely to do that, but I'm going to move this over here a little bit so I can just say that normal equals m omega squared r minus mg. Nope. Thinking ahead. Normal equals mg minus m omega squared r. That's what I meant. Now, just so that you guys have a little bit of, of hand in this game, um, I'm going to call on somebody to tell me what the normal force is for you when you're at the bottom of the Ferris wheel. Let's see if you can recreate that. And if you weren't here yesterday, I'm calling on you 
just so you know. All right, Natalie, can you tell me the two forces acting at the person on the bottom? Yeah. Okay, well, acceleration is not a force. I'll draw the weight, though. And I'm trying to draw it to be the same size as the weight was here. Is there another force that acts on them? I believe a normal force acts on them. Now, when I draw this force, how should I draw the length of that arrow? What direction are they having to accelerate, upwards or downwards? If they want to travel in a circle, their acceleration has to be towards the center of curvature which means the only way they travel in the circle is if the unbalanced force is upwards towards the center. So I'm going to have to have a normal force that is greater than the weight in order for the unbalanced force to be upwards. Now, because the net force is upwards, I think we can all be in agreement that we want this to be the positive direction now. So we change the direction of what is positive to match the direction of the acceleration. So it's not really much different, but it does have different implications. Yeah. Questions at this point? gonna move the mg to the other side <coughs> excuse me so this is at the bottom and this is at the top it doesn't seem too crazy to me that in one case you're going to feel heavier and in one case you're going to feel lighter anybody who's ridden the ferris wheel knows that's how you feel both the bottom and the top if you've never ridden one well that's, that's on you you should try it sometime it's not terribly exciting won't hurt you but I will say that, um, although you could work this out and find a numerical answer, you know I don't care about the numerical answer. I do care about the fact that this one suggests that you better be able to hold the person because you're going to be having to push up with more than their weight. So you spin it faster, then you are going to need to have structural capabilities to handle more than just the weight of a person. You put two or three people in that carriage, you better know what you're doing. But here's the problem, and this is if, if you're barely hanging on here, and it took a lot to get here, this next part's tough. I always try to call your attention to a negative sign, because negative signs mean things can happen. Negative signs allow for stuff to change, whether it's positive or negative. Negative signs also indicate the possibility of zero. Normal forces can't pull. They can only push, which means the smallest they can get is zero. There's the possibility that the normal force can be zero here. That means there's a possibility that you will lose contact with the chair. Spin it fast enough, and the person is going to feel like they just left the chair. Now, that might not sound like much to you, unless you're the one riding this ride where the moment you lose contact with the chair, you're no longer traveling in a circle, you're traveling in a parabola, because you are now a projectile. That's exactly what would happen. You spin something fast enough, the person will leave the chair. So the rate at which they spin these things isn't arbitrary. They want you to enjoy yourself, but they don't want you to enjoy it too much. it's not going to be enough for you to be able to set up a problem. You've got to make all the implications all the way to the end. And you know, I don't care what the number is. And neither will AP. They're going to want to ask about this. But the whole problem might be, what, what would be the 
maximum speed you could spin it and not fling the person off. I see the potential for that where I set this equal to zero and figure out what omega has to be to not fling the person off. That's the kind of conjecture they're making. You can follow all these steps and still not be able to answer that question because you don't really know what it is that you're finding when you get to that point. I need you to be able to find this information and then apply it and understand that the normal force can't be negative. The normal force can only be positive. And that the smallest it can be is zero. All right. Well, as far as I'm concerned, the rotational motion stuff is kind of done. There are lots of applications, though. Anytime something's traveling in a circle, it's going to be something like this. You're going to have to sub in either mv squared over r or m omega squared over r. I'm sorry, m omega squared times r. It's going to be one of those two. It's an understanding that when you're traveling in a circular path, your acceleration is based on how fast you're going and not on how fast the speed changes. So I'm always pretty careful, but know when you're traveling in a circular path. And we haven't gotten to the questions yet where you're doing both, where you're both changing your speed and changing your direction. That's going to be happening. We'll stick with this. And something else I said yesterday, and I want to reiterate, when you're traveling in a circle like this, your velocity is always tangent to the path. But that's actually always true. No matter what path you're traveling on, your instantaneous velocity is always tangent to the path. That's going to be an important thing for later. All right. Um, so it's just, it's not much different. It's just a little take on it. Here we're still going to have normal force and weight. Weight still has to be greater than the normal force when they travel in the circle. But down here, you're going to have tension and weight. The other type of problem we're going to see that's going to be a circular motion problem, but we need to have a little more information before we can do it, is a kid on a swing. When a kid on a swing makes it to the bottom, they're traveling in a circle. When they make it to the bottom, there's going to be tension in the cable that holds the kid. There's going to be a normal force in the kid's butt from the surface of the seat that he's on. But these are circular motion problems. Anytime a person has an arc as part of their path, it's likely a circular motion problem. You should be expected to be able to put in V squared over R or omega squared times R. In fact, we're going to be doing a lab in a couple of days. The lab's going to require that you, um, I love it because it's the potential for you guys to hurt yourselves. I like a good lab where you can hurt yourselves. If you hurt yourselves because of carelessness, so I can't get sued. I like that part too. Looks something like this. I'm going to give you a, like a little tube that's about the size of your hand. You're going to hang a weight here. And then you're going to have this small weight here that you're going to spin in a circle, above your head kind of thing. You want to spin this fast enough that you levitate this mass here. Now, of course, the potential for accidents is high. Every year, somebody has an accident. They don't have an accident when they're spinning it. They have an accident trying to get it to spin or get it to stop spinning. Meaning once they get it spinning, they're fine. Generally, they don't know how to stop. So we'll talk about ways to make sure you can stop it safely. The problem with this activity is it's, it's a multi-body problem. Because we have two objects that are connected. The net force on this object, you're trying to make zero. But you are purposefully trying to set the net force on this one to not be zero. You need it to be unbalanced in order for the stopper or the small mass to travel at a circular path. What we have to figure out is what is the connection 
between the object down here and the object here. This requires an understanding of the multi-body problem. So our only centripetal motion problem is going to be, or centripetal motion lab is this one, and it can only be done if we have an understanding of the multi-body problem. So today, it's time for us to which means we're going to be talking about Newton's third law. The thing about Newton's third law is that you already have a colloquial piece of knowledge about Newton's third law, a phrase that you've already been saying that you've probably said for years, or at least have heard it before. The phrase is, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. You ever heard that phrase before? It tends to come up. Uh, Newton's third law is responsible for that phrase. The thing is, that's not wrong, except that What's action and reaction here? For us, we're pretty specific. So I'm going to be a little bit more precise in the language. For every force, Newton's third law says that for every force, there is an equal and opposite reactive force. This is a law. There are no exceptions to this rule. There's another way I'd like you to know this. All forces come in action, reaction, pairs. Now, there are no exceptions to this. This is a law. So although we have been talking about this list of forces here, every time you put down one of these forces on an object, somewhere else in the universe was that force's reactive force. We focused on a single object but we don't have to, meaning we are part of a system. A force applied to one object means there is an equal and opposite force applied to another somewhere else, and that object is a part of our system. Now, whether or not both forces are effective, that's an important detail. Whether or not the effectiveness of that force can cause a change in motion. You see, Newton's third law requires that there are always pairs of forces. That doesn't always mean that the reactive force is as effective as the force you're observing. A person experiences weight downwards. That means there must be a reactive force somewhere else in the universe. Well, for the person, that reactive force is their force acting on the Earth upwards. It's got to be the same size, their mass times G. But if the Earth pulls down on you, then you are pulling up on the Earth. Now, gravity is far more effective at accelerating you than you are at accelerating the Earth. Because although this force acts on you, that same force acts on the Earth, and the Earth has a much bigger mass. The mass of the Earth, 6 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. You're not going to be particularly effective at accelerating the Earth. Not to mention, 
There's lots of other people on the earth, all of them pulling in their direction on the earth. Unlikely you are going to be able to move the earth. So just because there are reactive forces doesn't mean they are all effective. Consider a simple example. Maybe one less dramatic than the Earth system. I apply a force to the cart, a normal force to the cart. The cart's probably experiencing a frictional force. It's probably experiencing weight. I'm sure it's experiencing a normal force. Every one of these forces has a reactive force somewhere. The ground pushes up on the cart. The cart pushes down on the ground. The earth pulls down on the cart. The cart pulls up on the earth. The floor applies friction to the cart. The cart applies friction to the floor. I apply a normal force to the cart. The cart applies a normal force on me. In the system between me and the cart, there is a connection between the two forces. They form a Newton's third law pair. They must be equal and opposite. I must be experiencing other forces so that my net force was zero. The cart was not experiencing the same forces, therefore its net force was not zero. Newton's third law. The most likely starting place for a Newton's third law problem is what I call a train problem. There's a variety of ways the train problem is displayed. The first way we're going to see it is a row of boxes. So there's the box version of this problem. And then there's the train car version of this problem. They're arguably the same problem. They might appear different, but they're the same. If we consider that in this problem, maybe we have a five kilogram and a 10 kilogram box. Maybe here we have a five kilogram train car and a 10 kilogram train car pushing here at 15 Newtons, pulling here at 15 Newtons. These represent the same two problems. They're train problems in that you have a row of objects all accelerated by one force. In this problem, the internal forces between the boxes are normal forces. In this problem, the internal fo forces between the boxes are tension forces. They represent the same problem or the same style of problem in that we have a system being accelerated by an external force to the system. And that force is distributed to the two objects by an internal force at this interface. So let's just look at the first problem. Still, in all of these problems, free body diagram, every time, I've given you a framework in order to start these problems. That framework doesn't change. The five kilogram box is experiencing at least four forces. If we assume for the moment that friction is zero, then it's experiencing a 15 Newton force to the right. It's experiencing 50 Newtons downwards, normal force upwards, and there is another normal force. This force must be perpendicular to the surfaces. And therefore, 
Must be that direction. Yep. Weight of the box. MG, five times 10. All good. 10 kilogram box. 100 newtons downwards. Normal force upwards. Of course, the only other force acting on this box is between the two surfaces. These two forces constitute a Newton's third law pair, connects the two boxes together. In a problem like this, do you guys understand that it's very likely the two boxes must have the same acceleration? It's not like this box can accelerate faster than the other box. That means it would be accelerating through it. And it can't be that this box is accelerating faster than the other box and they separated. So would we all be in agreement that they have to have the same acceleration? That's what makes us a train problem. They are moving together. So the first box, net force 15 minus NB equals 5A. Right, net force equals MA. I'm just applying the rules now. Add up all the forces acting on the boxes, set it equal to MA. NB equals 10A. Add up all the forces acting on the box, set it equal to MA. Still following the rules? No worries. Are we sure? Makes it look so easy when Mr. Shelton does it. We have exhausted our series of steps. We created two formulas that represent the motion of the box. What you do with them now, well, that's on you. But I see, bless you, two equations and two unknowns. Do you see two equations and two unknowns? I do. I think we could figure out the force between the boxes or I think we could figure out the acceleration of the system or something like that. All Newton's laws could ever tell us was a single force or an acceleration. I see substitution. 